So by definition, a rational function is simply the quotient or the fraction of two different polynomials, which is why we started our study off with polynomials. We're going to have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator. So for example, here's our rational function example. This is like a textbook definition where you'd have f of x on top and g of x on bottom. The only caveat to all of this, or the exception to the rule of it can be anything, is that the denominator, g of x, cannot be equal to 0. Why can g of x not be equal to 0? Where is g of x in this fraction? Can my denominator ever be 0? No. Here's how we remember this. This is just a fun little math trick for you. If you have a 0 divided by some number, you're on track. That one's allowed. It's 0. But if you have a number divided by 0, that's a no-no. Not allowed to do that. So in general, if you ever divide by 0, you need to be like, whoa, no, no. That's a number divided by 0. You're not allowed to do that. It is undefined. Can't take things and put them in 0 groups. You'd be like, where do I even put the things? That's why we can't divide by 0. OK. So here are just some examples of rational functions so you can see what we're going to deal with. They can be as simple as 2 over x plus 3, or they can be as complicated as the other two examples we have there, where we have a quadratic on top and a linear on bottom, a quadratic on top and a cubic on bottom. We can get the degrees to be any varying number of degrees. As long as there is a polynomial on top and a polynomial on bottom, we have a rational function. Essentially, as long as the denominator has an x in it, it's a rational function. But what we're going to talk about first with these rational functions is end behavior. So that's where we left with polynomials, was talking about end behavior, looking to the left and the right of the graph. We actually previewed these on our last set of notes of what it would look like for a rational function. But we don't have to graph these to figure out the end behavior. We're going to look at the quotient of the leading terms. So by leading terms, I mean in those polynomials, the leading coefficient and degree of both the top and the bottom. That's what we're going to be looking at to determine our end behavior. So I'm going to use a bunch of color coding here, um, four colors. If you have highlighters and you like to do different things, I don't think I have enough highlighters out and about for you, so you maybe don't want to do this color coding, but here's what I'm going to do. In this fake rational function, the leading coefficient of the numerator is A. The degree of the numerator is n. Okay, so in the top we would look for the largest exponent, that's my degree, and then the number in front of its variable is the leading coefficient. Same exact thing for the bottom where we look for the degree d and the number in front of that variable is the leading coefficient for the bottom. We are going to be looking at the difference or the relationship between these degrees for the numerator and the degree for the denominator separately. There's three acronyms we're going to learn today. The first acronym is BETC, B-E-T-C. BETC stands for bottom equals top coefficients. So BETC stands for, you might want to write that down. I'm not going to write it, but you might want to. Bottom equals top coefficients. Meaning that the leading terms have the same degree. So the bottom degree is equal to the top degree. The degree. If the bottom equals the top, what we're going to do to talk about the end behavior is we're going to take the ratio of the leading coefficients. That's the C for coefficients. Where my end behavior, or the number that we go to as we go to infinity, is going to be the ratio A over B. That's where we have a horizontal asymptote. That's what our end behavior would be. So if we were to actually write that as an end behavior, it would be the limit as x approaches negative infinity for the function f of x is equal to the ratio a divided by b. Whatever we get. If it's a fraction, it's a fraction. If it's a whole number, it's a whole number. But whatever we get when we take the numerator leading coefficient divided by the denominator coefficient, that's our end behavior. It's also our horizontal asymptote. So on the right side, it would be literally the same thing. Limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is equal to, again, a divided by b. So on both sides, they're going to be the same for rational functions when it's bottom equals top. So when the degrees match, your leading coefficient is create your end behavior. 
okay? Case number two, a different acronym. So that first one was bottom degree equals top degree. For this one, we're gonna call this acronym BOBO. BOBO stands for bigger on bottom, zero. Bigger on bottom, zero. So in this case, the denominator is what's bigger. So it, we are bigger on the bottom than we are on the top, degree-wise. When that happens, your horizontal asymptote is at y equal to zero, period. I don't really have to think about anything else. I notice that the denominator is bigger, degree-wise. My leading coefficients don't even care because the limit as x approaches negative infinity for f of x should be equal to zero, the end on both sides. Limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equal to zero. So if the degree on the bottom equals the degree on the top, we divide the coefficients. If the bottom is bigger on bottom, the horizontal asymptote is zero, so your end behavior is zero. Case number three, the acronym we're gonna use is BOTN, B-O-T-N. We could probably figure out what the first three letters stand for. If this was bigger on bottom, what does this one stand for? Bigger on top. But the N stands for no horizontal asymptote. We don't have a horizontal asymptote and the end behavior is not as simple. Okay, so there's no horizontal asymptote, but the end behavior will match a polynomial with the properties that the leading coefficient is your ratio A over B and the degree is N of minus D which sounds really, really confusing, but when we get into it, it makes a little bit of sense, yes. B-O-T-N, botan, bigger on top, no horizontal asymptote. So for the other ones, the last letter tells you what the horizontal asymptote is, which is the same as the end behavior. C stands for coefficients, that's a zero for Bobo. The N means no horizontal asymptote. Since it doesn't have a horizontal asymptote, that means your answers for end behavior are going to be positive or negative infinity, just like a polynomial was. So we go back to deciding if the degree is odd or even, and if the leading coefficient is bigger or less than zero, which is what we just did for polynomials. But there is a special case in case three. It's not even case four, it's just a special case of case three. If the degree of the numerator is exactly one more than the degree of the denominator, so bigger on top by one, then you don't have a horizontal asymptote, you have what's called a slant asymptote. We won't be finding today the equation for the slant asymptotes because it's a little bit confusing. It requires long division, which we will get to later. But just knowing that a slant asymptote exists is important. Okay. So it seems like these would be pretty hard, but if you remember my three acronyms, these questions get a little bit uh, simpler. Questions I might ask you is, to determine if the following rational functions have a horizontal asymptote, slant asymptote, uh, and if it does, give me the equation of the asymptote. Lots of words. All I'm gonna ask you is actually, is that function Betsy, Bobo, or Botten? Is it bigger on top? Is this bottom equal top? or is it bigger on bottom? When I ask that, I'm talking about the degree. So what's the degree of the numerator? Two. two. What's the degree of the denominator? Two. two. We said that the top and the bottom are the same degree. So what I want us to write down is Betsy, because that's bottom equal to top. Betsy is gonna remind me what to say for the horizontal asymptote. The C part of Betsy says coefficients. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the coefficients, which is three and five, and I'm going to divide them, which means my horizontal asymptote, we're gonna use the acronym HA for that, okay, just because that's a lot of letters. My horizontal asymptote appears at Y equal to three divided by five, and that's it. If we were to graph this function, the sides of the function would flatten out at three-fifths because that's where our horizontal asymptote is. Do you see how the acronyms will help you answer these questions? If we try the second one, I'm asking you what's the horizontal asymptote, but you ask yourself, is this Bobo, Botten, or Betsy? 
So where is the degree bigger? Top, bottom, or are they equal? Bottom. What's the degree on the bottom? Two. What's the degree on the top? One. So this is bigger on bottom, which means immediately I know that the horizontal asymptote is at y equal to what number? Wait, wait, wait. What is this part of Bobo? Zero. That's it. Bigger on bottom is always zero. If we were to graph this function, it would start to flatten out. Flatten out's the wrong word because it's never flat, but flatten out-ish at zero. Okay, what about the third one? Where does this one have a bigger degree, on the top or on the bottom? Top, what's the degree on the top? What's the degree on the bottom? One, so if we are bigger on top, which means we do not have a horizontal asymptote. So we just literally say no horizontal asymptote. But anytime you have a button, I want you to think for more than just one second because it's bigger on top by how many degrees? So if it's two on top, one on bottom, it's bigger by how many? One. So actually, this one has a slant asymptote. If it is bigger on the top in the numerator by one degree, it will have a slant asymptote, which means as we look to the side, they don't look like they're getting flat. Again, they're not flat. They're always curved, just very minutely curved. These are going to go up and down to positive and negative infinity or vice versa. Not flat. Okay, let's give the three bottom ones a shot. You have D, E, and F. I want you to do the same. I'm asking you for the horizontal asymptote, but I'm really asking you, is this Bobo, Botner, Betsy? Take a second, see if you can get it. So since this one is bottom equal to top, what do we do to find the equation of the horizontal asymptote? What did the C part of Betsy stand for? Coefficients, my leading coefficient. So my top leading coefficient is four. My bottom leading coefficient is eight. We just divide them. What's four divided by eight? One half. Yeah, four divided by eight. You could put four divided by eight, but we're gonna simplify all of our answers always, so that's a half. Four over eight. If you wrote four over eight, yes. <laughs> we just need to reduce our fractions. For part E, is it Bobo, Botner, Betsy? Bobo. It is definitely bigger on bottom. Let's talk about why. What's the degree of the bottom? What's the degree of the top? Zero. There's no X showing, so it's a zero degree. It's a constant on top. That's fine. Still bigger on bottom, so what is the equation of the horizontal asymptote? Zero. zero. Very good. And last but not least, what about this one? Also Bobo. Again, don't be thrown off that it's negative. We don't care that it's negative because, again, it's a Bobo equation. So bigger on bottom means that the horizontal asymptote is going to be what? Zero. zero. Fabulous. All right. So the natural progression of after asking about just simply what is the horizontal asymptote is to take it a step further and talk about what the actual limit statements for the end behavior will be. But the nice thing is you answer that question basically with Bobo, Botner, Betsy. Botten is the only one that gets a little weird here. So for this question, when I'm asking you to write limit statements, which first of all, after grading all of your tests, there's still some of us who are not writing the limit statements the way I need them. It is different than how you wrote them in Algebra 2. We need to stack them. So you need to write them the way I'm writing them, not the way you wrote them last year. That's fine. It's just not calculus. And since this is pre-calculus, we're going to do it the calculus way. So to do this kind of question, we say, we ask ourselves, Bobo, Botner, Betsy. Tell me, Bobo, Botner, Betsy. Betsy. All right. So that's the first thing we notice is that this is a Betsy question, which means that it's going to have a horizontal asymptote at what equation? Y equal 2 over 6, which reduces to 1 third. Okay, great. That's the hardest part of this question because the limit statement just uses that number. The limit as x approaches negative infinity for the function f of x is just a third. And the limit as x approaches positive infinity for f of x is also a third. So it's not that much harder to write a limit statement for end behavior as long as you can tell me Bobo, Botner, Betsy, which we were doing great on. Do we see this? OK. For b, is this Bobo, Botner, Betsy? Bobo. So my horizontal asymptote is at what? 
zero, y equal to zero. Make sure you say y equal to zero. Zero is a number, y equals zero is an equation. That's what I want. But that also means that my limit statement, again, we're stacking our limit statements. We have to write it like this. The limit as x approaches negative infinity for g of x is zero, the same number. The limit as x approaches positive infinity for g of x is also zero. Amazing, easy. Bobo Botner Betsy's got your back on these questions. Until we get to a button question. Okay, this one is bigger on top. Yes? Okay. When it's bigger on top, and I'm asking you not for the horizontal asymptote, because we know it doesn't have one, but I'm asking you for the end behavior, we need to slight pause and actually think for a second. When this happens, we need to figure out the degree difference as well as the leading coefficient positivity, meaning we need the degree by taking the top polynomial's degree and subtracting the bottom. What is four minus three? One, that's an odd number. So this is an odd degree polynomial if we were thinking about it like a polynomial, okay? Stay with me on this. The leading coefficient is going to be the ratio of the top coefficient to the bottom. So in this case, it's negative three over one. Do we know where I'm getting those numbers from? If not, let me color code for you. Okay, the four came from here. This three came from here. The minus three came from here. And the one came from here. Okay, I just found all of the parts of these polynomials on the top and the bottom. I subtracted the degrees, I got one, that's odd. We have negative 3 over 1. So if I was thinking about this the way I thought about it with polynomials, I'd say this is an odd degree polynomial with a leading coefficient that is less than 0 since it's negative 3 over 1. What was the end behavior for an odd degree negative polynomial? Did your right hand go up or go down? Remember, your right hand is controlled by the leading coefficient. So if our leading coefficient is less than zero, does it go up or down? Down. So I'm going to skip to write the right one first, the limit as x approaches positive infinity for h of x. We said down. That's negative infinity, yeah? For it being odd, should the left side be the same or opposite? Opposite. So this is going to be the limit as x approaches negative infinity for h of x. That one's going to go to positive infinity. So Bobo, Bot, and Betsy have your back, especially for horizontal asymptotes. But when you have a Botten question, answering end behavior does require a quick pause. We pretend like it's a polynomial with a degree that subtracts the top from the bottom and a leading coefficient that just is the ratio between the leading coefficients. Yes? That's kind of confusing. We will get some more practice in on that. But for right now, does any, did I lose anybody on this question? Cool, cool, cool. So that's doing it from an equation. And we've also kind of seen these questions before. They were previewed on our last notes. But we can also ask end behavior from a graph. So from this graph, if I ask you to write the limit statements for the end behavior, all we have to do is look on the left and the right of the graph. What's happening on the left of this graph? What is it flattening out towards? What number? Well, yeah, we're going towards negative infinity on the left. But what y value are we getting closer to? Two. On the right side, what's happening? We're getting closer to two. So my limit statement here, the limit as x approaches negative infinity, that's the left side, we'll just call this f of x, it's not named, is equal to two. And the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is also going to be equal to two. So we are looking still on the left and the right of the graph. I'm going to keep saying the words flattening out. It's a mis That's not the right thing to say, but I don't know what else to say, honestly, because it looks to me like they're flattening out. They don't get flat, though. Okay, they don't get flat. We're always curving just slightly. Visually, it looks flat, but it's not flat. Okay, rational functions can also get really complicated, and they can look like this, with a whole bunch of things happening in the middle. But when I'm asking about end behavior, I'm not asking about middle behavior, so I literally could care less about what's happening in the middle when I'm asking about end behavior. On the ends, what are these arrows both headed towards? Negative one, that's my end behavior. Not asking about middle behavior yet, that's later. We're talking about end behavior. 
So for this one, we'd say the limit as x approaches negative infinity for, again, we'll just call it f of x, it doesn't have a name, is negative 1. And the limit as x approaches positive infinity for f of x is also equal to negative 1 because the arrows on the sides of the graph are both flattening out, air quotes, to negative 1. How do we feel about that? We're going to stop again and play another hoot just to make sure we understand the limit statements part of this. So grab your computers again. So again, sorry about all those mistakes on that kahoot. But like I said earlier, there is something other than a horizontal asymptote. The horizontal asymptotes are the ones where the graph looks like it's flattening out to a particular number. The other thing that a rational function could have is a slant asymptote. Finding the equations of slant asymptotes, like I said earlier, does require either synthetic or long division of polynomials. We're not going to get into that today. That's for later. That's a problem for future us. But what we're going to do is be able to identify which slant asymptotes would be parallel to certain lines, which is not that bad. So again, slant asymptotes appear if the degree of the numerator is bigger by 1, exactly 1. So what I'm going to call these is bigger on top by one. So not only just a button, but a button by one, or bigger on top by one. They don't have horizontal asymptotes. These in particular have slant asymptotes. Now, again, we have a textbook definition here that basically just tells us exactly what we said, that the leading coefficients, or sorry, the leading terms have a difference in degree by one. The main thing here that I want you to highlight, bless you, is this part right here. It says f of x has a slant asymptote parallel to the line y equal to a over b times x if you are bigger on top by 1. That's what all of that is trying to tell you. So if you're bigger on top by 1, it will be parallel to the line with the ratio of the leading coefficient of the top and the leading coefficient of the bottom times x. No, it might be up or down. We translate that vertically translated up, vertically translated down, but it will be parallel to that line, meaning it has the same slope. These are all things. So a question I could ask you that maybe doesn't ask you to find a slant asymptote, because again, problem for future us, which of the following rational functions has a slant asymptote parallel to the line y equal to 1 over 2x? Meaning, we need to figure out which one of these would, first of all, have a slant asymptote, meaning it's bigger on top by 1, and then see which one would have a leading coefficient on top of 1 and a leading coefficient on the bottom that is 2. So let's look at option number 1. Is option number 1 bigger on top by 1? No. If we were to give this one an acronym, we'd say this is Betsy. Betsy's do not have slant asymptotes, so there's no way that one's involved. You know what, let's write that down for ourselves. No slant asymptote. So we just remember why we deleted that. Betsy's do not have slant asymptotes. Betsy's have horizontal asymptotes. What about the second one? What is the acronym there? Bobo, bigger on bottom. Is Bobos, are they going to have slant asymptotes? No, they have horizontal asymptotes. So no slant asymptote there. So eliminate two. Option three, what is that one? Bigger on top, specifically by how many? By one, okay, tempting. That one potentially could have a slant asymptote, or in fact, it does have a slant asymptote. What is the ratio of the leading coefficient on top to the leading coefficient on bottom? One half, oh, that's what we wanted, right? We're gonna keep this one in mind, because this one, yes, has a slant, slant asymptote. And we know that the ratio is 1 over 2. I'm not putting y equals on this because that's not the equation of its slant asymptote. I'm just saying that 1 over 2 is the ratio there. If we look at the fourth option, what acronym would you give this one? Bobo, Botten, or Betsy? Botten. It's bigger on top by how many? Two. two. So is this one going to have a slant asymptote? No, the only ones that have slant asymptotes are bought in by one. Bought in by two, bought in by three, no. That still does not have a slant asymptote. So to actually answer this question, because it's one of those ones where you had to look at a bunch of things, would you pick A, B, C, D, or E? Very good. All right, that's pretty simple.
So only the third one would have a slant asymptote and a slant asymptote specifically that is parallel to one over two.